Thank you so much for joining us today, either on the app or online for uh, the messages and resources that we offer here. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, um, I would ask and even encourage you to think about joining with us, not only through prayer, but also financially. We're in the season of expanding our student ministry building for more ministry opportunities within our area. And we're getting really close to being able to do it, but we still have a little ways to go. If you would, you could see on your app or also online, you can go to giving and you can also make it reoccurring uh, for your convenience. Hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy the message. If you will, open your Bible to Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verse 1, and I always seem to do this, but before we get there, uh, we're going to do the New City Catechism, but it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 is where we're going to start at today. Question for week 12 is this, what does God require in the ninth and 10th commandments? Together as a church, ninth, that we do not lie or deceive, but speak the truth in love. Tenth, that we are content not envying another or resenting what God has given them or us. Powerful words to live by, easy to say, hard to do. In Hebrews chapter 10, as you're going to see, and actually the entire letter of Hebrews is all about the fact that Jesus is so much better than the old covenant. The old covenant, though it was good, though it was God's gift to Israel and mankind in general, it was not able because of the weakness of the flesh to save our souls. We're sinners, okay? That's just a plain fact. And this world doesn't necessarily believe in that, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But the fact is our sin separates us from God. And so what we call this Sunday is Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt and, and literally it was to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah that he was going to come in meek and humble before the very people. And that's exactly what he did during this week, um, which we call getting ready for the Passover week. During this week, it says that they were to look over the Passover lamb, inspect it to make sure that it had no blemishes. Well, if you notice in Matthew, as well as in Luke and in Mark, what do they do? They question Jesus. They challenge his authority. And another way they're doing is inspecting Jesus to make sure, and God is fulfilling his prophecy all along the way. Acts chapter 2 says that these people did not act just on their own, but it was a foreknowledge plan of God that Pontius Pilate would be in power at that time, that the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin would counsel against Jesus. Some three times after Matthew chapter 16, Jesus tells and foretells his death, not just that he's going to die, but exactly how he's going to die, and then that he's going to resurrect from the grave, which is all about next week, Resurrection Sunday. Next week, I'm excited about it. I hope it comes across well, but we're going to be talking about how do we live from resurrection to resurrection? How does a bride prepare herself for the groom, which is exactly what Jesus calls himself. We are the bride of Christ, he is the groom. Therefore, how do we live in anticipation and impurity and how does that motivate us, excite us as believers in Jesus Christ? And that's what we will touch on next week. So I wanna ask you a few questions. Why did Jesus need to die? Why, why did he need to die? Because if we could have done it on our own, then he died in vain. Galatians 3.20, literally, no, 2.20 actually says that. If we could have been saved by the law, then Christ died in vain. Romans 3.20 says that the law cannot perfect us. The law only gives us knowledge of sin. It's the law that literally reminds you, you can't do it and I can't do it. It's a reminder daily. So I ask you this, why did Jesus need to die? What is the reason for all the sacrifices in the blood in the Bible? Why? So, I mean, seriously, when you think about the temple, what do you think about? Most likely you think about something pristine, seventh wonder of the world. I mean, majestic and big and powerful. But do you think of blood splattered everywhere? Do you think of the week of Passover or even the day of atonement? I mean, do you think of blood flowing? Not a thousand, not ten thousand, hundreds of thousands of sacrifices being cut. I mean, if you know what blood smells like, it doesn't smell good. I mean, if, if you're a nurse or if you're a doctor, I mean, or if you're a hunter, when you split open an animal and it talks about the ways in which the entrails of the animal were to be burnt, I mean, this was a huge project. If you think about the priesthood 
Or if you think about the people of God and today in which you think of a pastor as this soft handed, you know, nitty little bitty anorexic looking guy. I mean, listen, they had blood covering them, if you will, almost from head to toe. When you read in Hebrews, what does it say? Everything that was to be used of God was to be sprinkled with blood, everything. When Moses consecrated the people of Israel, Exodus 19 and 20, what did he do? He sacrificed an animal, put the blood on a hyssop branch and was sprinkling it on the people of God. And some of y'all are like, I don't want no blood on me. You know, I mean, I, you get it? Everything was sprinkled with the blood of an animal. So why is sin, why so much blood and why is sin such a problem? And is, is it even a problem? Is it even a problem? The, the, the songs that we listen to say it's not a problem. It's just a mere joke. It's a mere slip up. It's not really something to really worry about. Most of preaching today, the reason I believe it's so ineffective is because there is no good news. Jesus just happens to be a good guy. There's no good news because there's no consequences. There's no hell. There's no wrath. All you have to do is look at Romans chapter one to realize that God's wrath is active now. He says he gave them up and he gave them over. He gave them up and he gave them over. He gave them up and he gave them over to a debased mind, to unnatural passions. He said, you want your will to be done? I will give you over to that. And it even says this at the very end of chapter one in Romans. It says, not only do they do these things, but they encourage others to do it. Hear my warning, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of you say, I'd never do that. But listen, do you go along with and do you say it's okay for others who actively live in sin and say, you know what, that's right for you. It's okay for you. You're equally guilty with them if you're doing so. Sin is sin. God has a problem with it. Why does God have a problem with sin? Because God is perfect. God is holy. God has brought a people out for what? To be holy, to dwell in his presence. What was the Garden of Eden supposed to be about anyway? It was all about communion with God, all about relationship with God. And as soon as they sinned, as soon as they sinned, the first sacrifice in Scripture is not found in Leviticus or Exodus. The first sacrifice in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 3. For they were improperly clothed. Therefore, God said, I must properly clothe you, which was the first covering, which was the first covering of blood, the first sacrifice that was to be given. Why so much blood? And why does the Bible, come on, this is, this is where, again, we're so soft. And it's not that we should try to offend, but we're so soft. You know, we, we have these passive churches and we wonder why our congregants, thankfully not here, but our congregants are crazy. You know, it's like we call ourselves Christians, but we live like pagans. Who would have thought, right? <laughs> live like hell and go to heaven. It's a great way to go. I mean, every single person that you go to their funeral, they were a saint and they loved Jesus. They just never went to church and never did anything for other people and weren't really that nice of a guy or a gal. And, but they love Jesus and we're going to have a mimosa in heaven together and I cheer you today. People do that stuff and you think I'm making that up. I'm giving a real example on Facebook just yesterday. I'm going to pour my mimosa out for you, my sister. You know, it's just like, how much crack do we have to smoke, like to lose brain cells to think that that's the way it is? I mean, do, do we not even hint at reading the Bible? Do you have too many coffee mugs with a few verses that make you feel good inside that you pick from the New Testament and the Old Testament? And so that nothing talk, do you understand this? It talks more about God's wrath in the holistic Bible. It doesn't stop from the Old Testament to the New. More about God's wrath than it talks about his love and his kindness. Do a word search. Look in your strongest concordance. Do whatever you want. It talks more about God's wrath. For if God is a God of love, he's also a God who hates that which is not which he loves. He is not a contradiction in terms. We've, we've got to understand this as people because few people speak about God. It's a problem. Sin's a problem. The only thing that makes sense about Jesus is that if sin was truly a problem, it took God himself to be able to pacify the very wrath of God, to be a propitiation, big word, an atonement for the wrath of God. Not only does it expiate, avert the wrath to come, but also appeases God. We're not talking about old Greek myths. We're talking about God himself saying all the way from the Old Testament, making a way, making a picture, making a shadow so that it would point to Jesus the whole way through. I challenge some of you 
who claim to be Christians and for some of you who claim to be otherwise, read the Bible before you try to talk about the Bible. Read the scriptures, know the word of God. John Piper said it this way, to be blind or oblivious to this wrath of God against sinners is incredibly dangerous. Like not being able to smell the gas leak gathering around the pilot light of your water heater, ready to blow your basement to smithereens and burn your house to the grounds. The reason it is dangerous is that if you are blind to the reality of God's wrath, you won't take the steps to find a remedy for sin and escape from God's anger. You won't take the steps. And Jesus even said this. Remember, we quote the verse, for God so loved the world, but do you not go past it to 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 and 21, where he says this, judgment has come. Not that he's come to judge now because he will be coming to judge later, but it says that they did not like light. What is light? Light is purity. Light is the exposing of one's heart. It says, rather than loving light, they loved darkness and hid away from God. It says in verse 36 of the same chapter that they are what? Those who do not believe now are already condemned. They're already under the wrath of God. And you're like, but I'm just living. I'm trying to be a good guy or a good gal. Listen, get your relationship right with God through Jesus Christ. Get your relationship right with God through Jesus Christ. For it says in Romans 1.18, it's on the screen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. It's not that they don't know. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at everything and just imagine that it all came from nothing. Don't you understand that when people say that nonsense and they make fun of myths from way back when, they're doing the same thing. The same thing all under the name of science. The Bible is literally the only one that gives an actual narrative that says in the beginning, God. God created. It reveals itself from heaven. When it says it reveals itself from heaven, what does this mean? It means every single person under the face of the sun is responsible is responsible to God. And some people say, well, what if they haven't ever heard about Jesus? Listen, we're responsible for our sins. Even those who have not heard the full revelation of God through his son, Jesus Christ, have revelation of God. God, Romans 2, has given them a conscience. And every single time you say, you ought not have done that, and you do the same thing on a different day, on a different occasion, with the same principle, different action, you hold yourself accountable. For it even says in Romans 2 that our own consciences will either free us or hold us accountable before God. God is a just God. He's not looking to get you. He gave his son Jesus to save you. Changes the way in which we look at everything. He goes on in chapter two. He says, do you, do you pre presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God's kindness is not him. Well, I really don't care. You know, just do what you want to do. Live like you want to live. I embrace all kinds of different attitudes. I'm pretty inclusive. Any way you'd like, just come on up to me, guys. It's going to be great. Doesn't say it. Doesn't say it. And Jesus didn't say it. Charles Spurgeon, whether he was the original or not, he still said this, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others to sin. The, the very words that I say for some of you and you are rejoicing as you hear them, you're saying, amen, that his blood has covered me, that he's a sacrifice, he's a substitute in my place because I am worthy of death. I'm not literally perfect, but he literally is a perfect savior. God the Father sees his righteousness in my place, has reckoned it to me, which is an accounting term saying, I see you as I see my son. And how do you do it? By faith, by faith in Jesus Christ. For chapter three of Romans says, there are none who are righteous. No, not one. No one seeks after God. No one's looking for him. There's these supposed seeker sensitive churches. They don't exist. They exist in language, but it's not true. If God's not calling you and God's not pushing you, if the Holy Spirit's not dealing with you. John 6, 44. If he doesn't draw you, which is a yank, which is a pull, a picture of a well that you would drip, uh, stick a bucket in, let it go down, and then what would you do? 
Come up, come up. Come on. Come water. He pulls. That is exactly what draw means in the Greek. See, our human nature is the one that likes to say, well, God's not sovereign in all things, just in some things. So you pick the good things and you say, well, the bad things God must have no hand in or he's not capable of doing anything. Well, I want to tell you this. You're going to be a miserable person when you suffer them because you want to cherry pick when God's God and when he's not in control. See, for us, wrath is a problem. God being a judge, who, oh my gosh, like God would never judge. I love watching people. They're like, only God can judge me. That should scare the mess out of you. And here, here's the funny part. You ready for this one? Your employer, he can judge you. You know how? He can fire you. Your mother, your father, they can judge you. This life, you talk about nobody can judge me. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. You don't make a score on your ACT or SAT. You just got judged. You can only go so far. Can't get into this college or that college. You got judged. Not lacking in value, but what is this new age nonsense, nonsensical stuff that we do? You know what I mean? Like, what does that even mean? We get judged every single day. In Matt, or John chapter 5, verse 22, it says this, For the Father judges no one, just in case you're worried about it, but has given all judgment to the Son. Has given all judgment to the Son. He goes on to say that there will be a day when his voice is heard by all those who are in the grave, and those who have done good will come into resurrection, but those who have done wicked will go into eternal punishment. There's no annihilationism. So I want to give you a few sub points and we got to move. Sin is a problem. Maybe I just said that a few times over. Sin is a problem, but this world doesn't even believe in sin. Isn't that funny? Because the same people who say, I'm the agnostic and I'm the atheist and I'm the secularist and I'm the humanist, the same people have no issue with saying there are no moral absolutes until something happens to them. Until their stuff gets taken, until their truck gets stolen, until their daughter gets raped, until something happens, and that's wrong. There are moral absolutes because there is a God. There are moral absolutes because there is a God and you'd have to be blind, not just physically, but spiritually blind, dead, to not recognize there is a God. Not only a God, but a God in which you and I must answer to. Sadly, Christians as well. We give language to sin, but we, in many cases, have no problem doing it. Well, that's not really a bad sin. It's just, it's one of those little feeble sins. And so I don't really, you know, I should apologize. But here's the deal. If it doesn't break your heart in the process of some of this, and maybe not at that very moment, but in the process of you realizing or someone talking to you, holding you accountable, saying, do you realize what you just did? Do you realize what you just said? And you'll never have someone to say that to you if you never allow someone to get close enough to you. Hence, small groups. Hence, some of you saying you have no friends. Hence, be a friend first. We're never gonna get there. It blows my mind when some people do stuff and it's like they're immediately defensive as though they want to shift. I don't wanna own my mistakes. Listen, we are people who own our mistakes. We are responsible. I'm responsible. When I fail, then I need to confess my sins. I need to repent to whoever I've affected, not maybe just one person, but maybe more, and seek to live right from that point forward. If sin doesn't bother you, you should be scared to death and even questioning where you're at with Christ. Do you understand? If sin doesn't bother you, you should be scared. It should bother you. What is sin? Sin's not only an act of wrongdoing, but a state of alienation from God. It signifies a ruptured personal relationship with God, and it comes from the heart. What is sin? Sin is expressed through our words. Sin is expressed through our actions. Sin is expressed through our thoughts. I had the flu in December. If any of y'all know, there's certain things that come along with having the flu. You don't realize you have it until it's just completely consumed you, and you've already probably gotten about 5, 10, 20, 40 other people infected with it because you didn't realize you were housing it for the week beforehand, right? When you have the flu, you have horrendous aches, pains, sweating. I got my bed in one night, three different times, had to roll different blankets because my entire bed was covered in sweat. Took a shower, didn't even realize I took the shower, but I knew I needed a shower. I mean, it was just day after day, week, about two weeks after that. Here's the deal. What were those? 
Was that the flu? No, the flu was in my body. Those were the symptoms of the flu. Listen, sin is a symptom of a broken and corrupt heart alienated from God. That is why we search in all these different areas for fulfillment, for purpose, for satisfaction. That's why we keep going. When Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all you who are weary and I'll give you rest. You can be weary at 13. You can be weary at 45. The whole point is that you come. There is no salvation without faith. There is no grace without salvation. Number two is this, the sacrifice could never take away sins. The sacrifices, they, they couldn't do it. The sacrifices weren't able to do what the people thought. Even though it says in Leviticus 17, 11, listen to what it says. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes the atonement by the life. What does this mean? If I drain out all of your blood, if someone were to say to me, well, the life's not in the blood. Listen, if I cut your throat and you bleed out, you're dead. Get it? The life is in the blood. Okay? So go scientific with me if you want. Life's in the blood. Cut your wrist, cut your throat, you're done. Out. Gone. So here's the deal. An innocent animal would have to be given on behalf of the sinner. In every single individual case, what did the sinner have to do? Present a sin offering, place its hands on the sin offering, which was another way of saying, I identify with the fact I deserve what's about to happen to this innocent, unblemished animal. I deserve that. On the day of atonement, there were two goats that were given. One was what we call a scapegoat, right? We use the metaphor today. And the other one was the sin offering. What was happening here? In both cases, the high priest would, on that day, put his hands for the people of Israel on the sin offering, slit its throat, take its blood. One time in the year, they were able to go into the Holy of Holies, sprinkling the blood within the area to make atonement for all the people for that year. But the scapegoat was taken out into the farthest part of the wilderness and let go. What was that doing? Two things to show. One picture, that our sins had been covered, and secondly, that they had been pushed so far away, which were out of the sight of God himself. It was all pointing to, it was all a picture of what Jesus Christ himself would do in the atonement on the cross. And third, there is this, is the animal sacrifices have always pointed to Christ. They've always done it, always. Colossians 2, 17, look on the screen with me. These are <clears throat> a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, a shadow is when light is cast, but it's also very vague. You can barely tell what it is. Even though you maybe know that that's your shadow because of the light casting it on it, there's a big difference between your shadow and you. The Old Testament, y'all listen with me for a second. The Old Testament was a shadow of Christ to come. The Old Testament was always a picture until the fulfillment of time was to come. Galatians chapter three, what did he say? He says, when the time comes, the right time, when Christ is to die for our sins, then, then and only then. So what does it go from here? Hebrews chapter one, verse three, it says this about Christ. He, Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He's the exact imprint of his nature. I'll give you a few examples in the Old Testament. Adam and Eve, what are they? They are what? The bride, it represents the bride of Christ. They were to be a symbol of the marriage to come because of Christ himself. What was the garden? What was the garden? The garden was the place where God's presence fully dwelled. What do we go from there? What about Abraham? He was a friend of God. Genesis chapter 22, what was he supposed to do? He was to make a sacrifice of his only son, Isaac, which was a what? Picture of Christ himself coming to make atonement. And here's another thing about us. Are you willing to give that which means the most to you, to the Lord. And Abraham was. Abraham was. What about the law? It pointed us to our need for a savior. What about Moses? It pointed us to a greater leader who was to come. What about the Exodus? It pointed us to the great Exodus, which Jesus himself would lead, bringing us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't you, you can, you can see it, right? You can see some of these little pictures. What about David? He's the son of David, which means he's by the heir. He's the king to come, right? He's the rightful king who will reign forevermore, right? 
What about Solomon? He's the one who's wiser than Solomon. What about Jonah? He's the one who proclaims a better message than Jonah because Jonah was going to Nineveh to say, what, 40 days? God's gonna kill you if you don't repent. And Jesus said, unless you repent, you likewise will be just like these people. What was one of his first things he said in Mark chapter one? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And you might have thought, are you ever going to get to the text? Here we go. I'm going through the text because I wanted to set it up. I'm going to read it, make three short points, and go from there. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of its realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since that worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written to me in the scroll of the book. When he said the above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. He does away with the first covenant in order to establish the second. Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, the promise. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once, y'all listen church, once for all. And every priest stands daily in his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered For all time, a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for the time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant which I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened to us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And that is the word of the Lord this morning, and what a good one it is. This is basically the peak, if you will, of Mount Everest within this epistle. Chapter 10 brings together all that's been said in the first nine chapters, giving us this beautiful picture that Christ once and for all has forgiven us of our sins for those who believe and trust in him. So take these down. Here we go. Number one is what the law could not do, Christ has accomplished. What the law could never do, it could never fully atone for the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Yet it says that Christ takes away our sin by the blood of the new covenant that he has made. By the cross of Jesus Christ, by the resurrection from the dead, he takes away the sin of those who believe. Notice what it says in verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. What does that tell you as a church? What does that tell you as people of God? For all time, past, present, future, forgiven. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you feel guilt about your past, if it's about the sin, that's one thing, but saying I got to continue to live under that weight, you've been forgiven. 
You've been set free. God has given you a new leash on life and not just one to squander, but one in which to live fully for him. You've been forgiven. You've been set free. Where's the hallelujahs in the room this morning? I fear that we get so used to this. We get so numb to this that we don't find it to be unique, that we don't find it to be special, that we don't find ourselves saying and recounting all of the past sins and which deserve the very judgment of God, the very wrath of God. Because some of us say, well, God, he's, he's kind of cuddly. Did you forget the ark? Did you forget Noah's day? You remember his promise. He says, I, I won't do it like that ever again. You see, a lot of people think that the angry father was substituted for the friendly Jesus son, in the New Testament. And Jesus is a friend. And a lot of times we, we, we take stuff and we're just like, you know what, God's all, he's, we're done with that. He was a mean guy back then, but he's a, he's a sweet guy now. Don't you realize what the New Testament hits on far more than the Old Testament? It talks all about the what? The day. Did you notice in verse 25 in your Bibles? It was capitalized, wasn't it? Because it's signifying what? The day. Not a day. Not a tsunami that wipes out 250,000 people in 2004, not an earthquake in Haiti, not tornadoes, not that. No, there is coming a day when God says, I will judge the world. There's coming a day when he says, I will judge it, not with water this time, but with fire. There's coming a day, Matthew 25, where it says the king will be seated on his throne and every single person, and he will divide those who were truly his and those who were not. There's coming a day. There's coming a day. Too many preachers, sad to say, make it sound like, and too many Christian authors who get put in Lifeway and we think that everything in Lifeway has to be good because it's there. It's not. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm just saying it's not. There's a lot of stuff out there that is ethereal and has nothing to do with the Bible besides tagging a verse on there to say, oh yeah, that makes it legit. It's got a verse on there. The problem is too many people think they're saved. That's not a problem. To be saved, obviously, it's a great thing. But the problem is that too many of us pastors make it sound like, well, everybody's, everybody's in the party. Everybody's saved. And it's like, no, no. We, we read the Christmas verse in Luke 2, and it, and it says, you know, that, that glory in the highest, right? And it says, peace on earth to, we stop right there. Peace on earth. To whom he is well pleased. With whom he is well pleased. God's not pleased with sinners. Y'all get what I'm, I'm trying to go after? And if you don't, talk with me after service. We'll talk for a little bit. I got time. I'm saying that we as followers of Jesus Christ should remember what we've been saved from and where we're going. What, what's going to occur so that we can have energy to live as we ought to today, as we'll talk a lot about next week for by a single offering for by a single offering why did God waste 2,000 years then basically with all these animals Peter's going crazy you know I mean why, why kill all these innocent animals what was it was a point it was to show you it was to show you what was to come it was to show most of us don't learn our lessons until we learn it in the school of hard knocks correct a proud person will never come to Jesus. Matthew 7 says, do not cast pearls to swine or they will trample you with them. What does that mean? Don't force the gospel of the King Almighty on someone who spits in the face of him. Love them, seek to see them saved, but don't just force something that they say, I don't want anything about that. We serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God who created it all. Don't cheapen the gospel message by simply saying, well, just, just whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's just, it's okay. Just keep on living. No, no, no. God doesn't want your stuff. God wants you. God changes your whole life. Not just your dirty mouth. Not just your stupid habits. Not just our weaknesses in our flesh. God changes your whole life. He's perfected once for all time those who are being, present tense and continually, sanctified. What does that mean? We're a work in progress. Amen. We're not perfect people. 
but we serve a literally perfect Jesus. No doubt about it. We're not perfect people, though we do seek to continue along that line. Don't use the, I'm only human excuse. You're not one of them. Don't use that excuse. Continue to seek him. Number two, the work of Jesus is decisive, forever perfecting those who believe. Verse 12, it says, When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. What, what does this mean? What does it mean that he sat down? Does that mean that Jesus is lazy? For almost 2,000 years, he's just been like, Father, can I get up? You know what I'm saying? Like, is this time out? Like, good job, son. Now sit here. We're going to wait for 2,000 years, 3,000 years. You don't know how long. And I want you to know this, and with all sincerity, every single person, including Paul himself, thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime, okay? That is what we ought to do. That's what we ought to say. For those who say, it's got to be now, well, hang out, live holy, and sooner or later, you will see him. You will, no doubt. For those who love him, you will see him. What does it mean that he sat down? Number one, it means that the work is done. John chapter 19, verse 30, when he was to give up the spirit, it literally says, it is finished, it's done. We as people of Jesus don't talk about what we've done. We say he's already done it. Whatever flows out of us is because we're connected to the vine. Whatever good works come out of our lives, not because we're amazing, because he is alive and lives in us. That's what that is. All the bad, take credit for it. All the good, give it to Jesus because that's where it belongs. All that with is in our lives. Number two is that the Father is satisfied with the sacrifice. I don't have to walk on eggshells saying, well, I did give my life to Jesus, but I really made a mistake the other day, and now, well, is he going to strike me? Is it going to be bad? No, no, no. There's some people who go to different churches, literally they believe that. They're like, if I were to have done something right before I have this car crash, I'm going to hell. It's like, no. Once and for all, is your sin greater than the blood of Jesus? Because if you think it is, you're an awfully cocky and ignorant person. Don't mean that rude. I'm just saying. For those who've applied the blood of Jesus in their lives. See, some churches are scared to death when you say stuff like that. Because they're like, they're going to go crazy. They're, they're going to go crazy. They're gonna, no, no, no. Pastoring is not about putting leashes around people's necks. It's about unleashing the Holy Spirit of God in your life. It's not that I have any power with that, but to prompt you to say, be filled with the Spirit and you will not satisfy or gratify the things of the flesh because you live by God's grace. It's totally different. That's why legalistic churches, they don't work. They don't work. And third and closing here, therefore, let us draw near. Amen and amen to that. Let us draw near. Let us be excited about it. Hebrews 10, and 23, it says this. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is what? He's faithful. James 1, 17 says that God is a God who does not change. No shadow of change in him. He is solid. He's straight. He's not going to let you down. He's not going to say one thing to you on a Monday and another thing to you on a Tuesday and be a totally different person. He's not a schizo. Just clarifying. And for those of you who say, you know what? I don't know about all this stuff. Here's a few verses to close. Acts 17 to verse 27. It says they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. That word right there literally means that you're blind. Like you're, you're feeling your way. But here's the reassurance. He's not actually far from us. Your sins are not greater than the blood of Jesus. Your past is not greater than the blood of Jesus. I beg you, repent of your sins and in faith, trust in Jesus Christ. For if you say, no, I'll stand my own and let God judge me where I'm at, you will get exactly what you ask for. For he is a God who honors your word. He'll give you exactly what you want. For the wages of sin is death, 
but the free gift of God is eternal life. He who was rich became poor so that we who were completely destitute of anything good might become rich. He who was righteous died for the unrighteous so that we might die to sin and live. By his wounds, you are healed. That's all I got for you this morning. We're gonna close right here. We're not gonna have any music, but let's stand together.